friends and colleagues. It is indeed a very great pleasure to be here addressing you this evening and I thank Professor Kambutoglu, the director, for his kind invitation to pre present this introduction to the seals and signets from the Bronze Age Aegean. I should like also to thank Professor Dr Ingo Pini, Director Emeritus of the Corpus de Munotion and Mechanischen Siegel at Marburg, Germany, and Professor Demantis Paniotopoulos, the present Director of the CMS at Heidelberg, for their kind permission to use the material from the CMS archives, including the magnificent colour images which you see before you now and which you will enjoy in the subsequent slides. The jewels that speak to us, seals and signets from the Bronze Age Aegean. Tonight we are taking a journey back in time to the second millennium BCE, to the land surrounding the Aegean Sea to meet the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. These two peoples are renowned for many wondrous creations. Palaces with frescoed walls, efficient weapons and fast ships, fine pottery, bright textiles, exquisite jewellery, and the seals and signets which are the subject of this presentation. Many of you will already have made this journey when you visited modern day Greece and went to the Bronze Age sites of Knossos and Mycenae. However, when you gazed at the great procession fresco at Knossos with its almost lifeless sized cup bearers like the one illustrated here, I bet that no one pointed out to you that he's wearing a seal on his left wrist. Enlarged in the inset, you see on his wrist a round shape with two small protrusions. This is a stone seal finished with gold finials, which mark the ends of the string hole where the tie was threaded through so the seal could be worn. Just such a seal is the first one illustrated at the top left. Look closely at these superb examples of Minoan and Mycenaean seals and signet rings. We can readily appreciate that each seal is a jewel in its own right and precious to its owner for that reason. But we must remember that each seal is doubly precious because it also bears her or his chosen insignia. As both jewel and mark of identity, the seals and signets were proudly worn, suspended round the neck as with the ivories, worn at the wrist as with the seal stones, or on the finger as with the magnificent signet rings. As we discuss the seals and signets tonight, I would like you to be conscious of the scale of the material. You see the images of the seals and signets thrown up on this huge screen, and as you admire the exquisite detail of the work, it's easy to forget how small they really are. So I ask you at this point to look at your hands. Your thumbnail is a good guide to the size of most of the seals, perhaps a little larger for some. Now may I ask you to imagine one of the colourful stone seals strapped on your wrist, rather as we now wear a watch, or one of the gold signet rings placed on your finger, where the bezel will gleam in the light to show you its design. Please continue to keep in your mind the scale of the jewels as we proceed to the later slides and a close examination of the images. Aegean glyptic jewels, the evidence in detail. Glyptic simply means carved with a design and we study the design from the impression made by the seal. In the Aegean, virtually all seals are stamp seals. That is, they make their impression simply by being pressed down or stamped. Seals. The seal example here is a red carnelian lentoid. It is carved in taglio, which means the design is carved into the stone as an impression. When the seal is pressed in some soft material, here plasticine, it results in an impression that is raised like a little miniature relief sculpture. Now note also that the impressed design is a mirror reverse of the original. The seal design is always discussed from the impression and from this purpose, a, for this purpose, a drawing of the impression is usually provided. As we proceed tonight, you will become familiar with the views of the original, the impression, the drawing. Signets. The signet example here is the oval bezel of a gold signet ring, and this time the design has been engraved and punched into the metal. 
again when the ring is pressed into the plasticine the design appears in mirror reverse as a small relief and the drawing is done from this. Ceilings. However, sometimes we do not have the original seal or signet, but the original sealing. In the ancient world, seals were pressed not in plasticine or red sealing wax, but in soft, moist clay. Because the palaces and villas were destroyed by fire, these original clay impressions were baked hard and they remained in the destruction debris to be found by archaeologists thousands of years later. So in the third column, you see a gap because there is no original seal or ceiling remaining to us. But you do see the original clay ceiling, baked hard and a little cracked by the fire. And again, a drawing can be made for ease of illustration and discussion. This is a famous ceiling called the Master Ceiling because of its grand depiction of the muscled male atop a city. And it was found by the Danish excavators in the Minoan city, which is underneath modern Hanyar in the west of Crete. How exactly were the seals made? For stone seal carving, it is essential to understand the nature and hardness of the material. Today, the hardness is classified according to the Mohs scale, where one is talc and 10 is diamond. For the early bone, ivory and the soft stone seals of Mohs scale 2 to 3, the designs were cut with handheld blades. The change came with the discovery of the fixed lapidary lathe, which enabled the Minoan engravers in the old palaces to move to the harder semi-precious gems of Mohs scale 6 to 7. And you see a selection on the table. Uh, the amethyst, rock crystal, carnelian, agate and chalcedonies in all their myriad colours. None of these lathes remain to us, nor are there any illustrations from the Bronze Age to show seal working. A tombstone of the ancient Greek world illustrates a lapidary lathe and you see it at the top illustration on the right. Immediately below it you see the sketch of a lathe as still used in traditional workshops in Asia. And below that again, a reconstruction of just how uh, uh, such a bow lathe is used. The apprentice moves the bow back and forth so the string can turn the drill. The craftsman holds the stone seal blank up to the bit on the end of the drill and thus the cut is made. The last photograph is of the workbench of a modern seal engraver. The electric drill is mounted on the right, looking rather like a handgun, and the various shaped drill bits stand upright in a tray on the left. The work is now easier, but the result is not necessarily any finer. The Aegean seal evidence in total comprises some 11,000 seal signets and sealings, giving some 12,500 seal faces carrying designs, since some seals have two, three or four faces. However, when you take the span of seal production and use from the early Bronze Age in Crete to the end of the palace states in Mycenaean Greece some 1,400 years later, it is clear that only a small percentage of all seals made now remain to us, perhaps as little as 1%. Not all the 11,000 examples are of the quality I am showing you here tonight, but even the humble seals made in soft stone with simple designs tell us that their use is widespread and that it is not only the elite who possess the seals. This is particularly so in Minoan Crete from the earliest times and it makes clear that the desire to own a seal is deep in the Minoan psyche. Seals speaking to us through their function. Now the seals speak to us in three ways, through their function, through their art and through their iconography. We will turn to the art and iconography shortly, but let us first look at how the seals were used. Sealing commodities for storage. The basic usage is to seal the harvest produce, particularly the grain, olive oil and wine, for storage. The first picture shows the back of an original sealing and you can clearly see that the clay has been pressed over the rim of some pot. 
The second picture shows a clay stopper which would have sealed a jar and you can see on the upper right the indentation where the seal has been pressed in the clay when it was soft. This method of sealing commodities is a very simple but efficient way of identifying ownership of the container and its contents and it is tamper proof. Once the clay sealing is broken there is no way to put it back together again. And so this ensures that the sealed commodity will remain intact until the rightful owner or their representative comes to break the seal and open the door, the chest, the jar or the flask. Look at the right of the screen at the wonderful aerial view of the great palace at Knossos. The ring of trees encircles the immediate palace area and on the left you can see the many narrow storage rooms that comprised the west ba basement. The palaces were the central collecting and distribution points for the Minoan and Mycenaean economies and it was extremely important to have all this activity carefully controlled by an administration that kept detailed records and were authenticated by complex sealing practices. The whole question of the administration of the palace economy is one of the most active research topics at present for Bronze Age scholars and the seals have much to tell us. <coughs> Identifying items for transport. Look again at the aerial view of the palace. At the top of the picture you see the royal road leaving the north entrance of the palace and ru running west eventually to reach the port for Nosos not far away on the north coast of Crete. The area today is Poros Katsambos, a seaside suburb of Heraklion. This immediately reminds us that the trade and princely gifts sent abroad were also of great importance to the Minoans and Mycenaeans. A glimpse of the movement of these goods is given to us by the third original ceiling pictured here. The design of a chariot and horses has been impressed in reddish clay. This ceiling was found on the island of Thera at the site of Akrotiri. But identical ceilings, that is, made with the same seal on the same type of clay, were found at two different sites in Crete as well. The villas of Sclavacampos in the north and Aetriada in the south. The investigation of trade within the Aegean and beyond to Egypt and the Near East is also an important subject for Bronze Age studies and again seals and sealing practices are very informative. Sealing documents in small packages. The sealings also testify to the writing and transmission of documents in the Minoan world. The fourth sealing pictured here is the back of the great master sealing I showed you in the previous slide. You can clearly see that some soft parchment was carefully rolled and tied with a cord and then had the blob of clay pressed down on it, thus leaving these shapes on the underside of the ceiling. What was written on the document? Alas, we do not know. The very fires which baked the ceiling and preserved it for us also destroyed the parchment package. However, even if we did have this Minoan message, we would not at present be able to read it. Of the three main writing scripts in the Bronze Age Aegean, the two earlier scripts, Minoan hieroglyphics and Linear A, are, have not yet been translated. They do appear on the seals, seen here in the green jasper prism and the gold signet. Only the latest script, Linear B, the one which belongs to the Mycenaeans, has been translated and that is an early form of Greek. Seals speaking to us through their art. When we consider to how the seals speak to us through their art, we must remember that the Minoan experience encompasses well over a thousand years of artistic innovation in Crete, from about 2600 to about 1450 BCE. Before the palaces, the many finds in the communal tombs of early Minoan times show that the people in the small village communities were carving seals in soft stone, bone and ivory. 
hippopotamus incisor, by the way, not elephant tusk. This was a highly inventive time, creating figural seals in the shape of animals like the seated monkey and smooth stamps like the black stone pet shaft. The designs are carved on the base, as here you see with the spiral and flower decorations and the agrimia. The agrimi is the Cretan wild goat. In the old and new palaces. The old palaces were built in Crete in Middle Minoan times and this was a peaceful era of expansion which saw many developments and in many artistic fields including the creation of the beautiful Kamari's pottery. You will remember that seal carving was facilitated at this time by the invention of the fixed lapidary lathe which allowed the cutting of seals in hard stones. You see the black and yellow flecked stone prism on the middle left. Here is a mastered ship, a new subject for seal designs. The old palaces were levelled in an earthquake and were rebuilt in the same places but larger than before. These were the great new palaces and, and also at that time the luxury villas of the late Minoan times were centred were centres where the arts flourished as never before. In particular, the seals and signet show great innovation in artistic composition. The gold signet carries a naturalistic portrayal of an outdoors scene where a man kneels leaning across a boulder and turns to hail a bird swooping down and bringing something in its beak. The venture into naturalism at this very early time in world art history comes as a surprise and is in stark contrast to the codified arrangements for depicting humans and animals in contemporary artistic traditions of Egypt and Mesopotamia. Look at the two signet designs on the middle right. In the bull leaping scene, the bull is depicted in the flying gallop, a Minoan artistic convention which admirably conveys all the power and speed of the magnificent animal. The second design shows an experiment with perspective, with the four beautifully gowned women placed at different levels in the flower field to suggest depth in the composition. It will be a long time before art again frees figures from being firmly anchored to a ground line and continues to develop perspective. The new palaces survived the cataclysmic eruption of the volcano on the island of Thera and flourished again. Then about 1450 BCE, all the palaces and villas were destroyed and when the next period is observed in Crete, it has a decidedly Mycenaean cast. The legacy to the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans had been developing their own dominions on the mainland at the same time as the, as the new palaces were flourishing in Crete. And the first glimpse of this comes from the shaft grave circles at Mycenae. The treasures from these shaft graves are now displayed in the first main gallery of the National Museum in Athens. And I am sure that many of you will have marvelled at the great gold face masks and been astonished at the riches there. The Minoan legacy to the Mycenaeans is clear from the shaft graves period on and you can see in this gold signet showing a battle scene. The yellow and red agate lent next door to it further reveals how influential the seal designs were. It shows two lions rampant about a curved Minoan altar and there are many similar seal stones and there are many similar seal designs which also include a pillar standing on that altar. This is the design of the great stone carving above the lion gate at Mycenae. Powerful in effect because of size and placement and material, the composition of the lion gate relief nevertheless belongs to the seal cutter's repertoire. The Mycenaeans continued to cut seals and engrave signets and to use them with the same sealing practices for their administrative work in the palace, just as had the Minoans. Only now the records were kept in Linear B, Mycenaean Greek, even in Crete. 
I end the art survey at, 50, at 1200 BCE with two ceilings from the Palace of Nestor at Pylos in the western Peloponnese, baked in the final conflagration at the time of the destruction of all the mainland palaces. However, these two ceilings were made with heirloom seals. When the cutting of hard stone seals ceased sometime about 1300 BCE, it signalled the end of the great artistic tradition of seal manufacture, which had been created by the Minoans some 14 centuries before. Iconography, images of the world of nature. Iconography from the Greek simply means writing in pictures. So we look now at the images to see how the seals speak to us there. Trees, flowers and landscape. Here art verges on naturalism. The two lions in the flying gallop speed over rocky ground in an exotic landscape marked by the spreading palm. Well-dressed ladies bring, bring flowers to a shrine built on rocky ground and walk through a flower field to do so. The wondrous action shot of the hound holding at bay a huge agrimony is composed cleverly within the confines of the rectangular seal face by modelling the rocky ground to subtend the hound but also swinging it up to provide a perch for the agile agrimony. Animals. Animals are the most frequently used subject matter for the seals. They are shown in peaceful studies standing tall as with the deer on the right, or suckling their young as with the cow on the left. She tenderly turns her head to lick her calf as it drinks deeply. Animal attack scenes are also great favourites, seen in the middle seal with a cat attacking birds, all a flurry of fur and feathers. Birds, butterflies, dragonflies and bees. Birds are a favourite, just flying along or carrying something in their beak, as here, or being attacked, as we have just seen. The butterfly and dragonfly are often seen paired and shown as viewed from above. In contrast, the bee is shown quite stylized, as in the third image, where three bees hold a circle representing a honeycomb. Just such a design, with two bees and a honeycomb, is worked in gold and known as the Malia pendant. Every tourist shop in Crete has it copied in gold or in silver, larger or smaller as needed for a necklace, a brooch or earrings. <coughs> Dolphins, fish and sea creatures. No other people pays as much attention to the sea and its creatures in their art as to the Aegeans. Here we have dolphins diving, flying fish skimming around each other, and a great octopus. Iconography. Images of the world of humans. Daily work and seafaring. Hardworking herdsmen, successful fishermen, and seafarers on the quay are shown here. The first seal has two shepherds milking their sheep into the same pail, and the design is flipped and repeated above. Exactly the same milking technique is shown in the photograph taken by the then CMS director in Country Crete some years ago. Festival and procession. In the first seal, women approach an outdoor shrine built on rocky ground. In the second seal, we do not know the destination, simply that the men wearing a special costume carry the famous Minoan double axe and an elaborate folded cloak. The third example, a fragmentary ceiling, perhaps records some special event with the gigantic horse superimposed on a masted ship with rowers at their oars. Both this image and the one above it remind us of the great ship fresco from the site of Akrotiri in Thera. Athletic contests and the bull sports. The first image here is of a gold signet recently discovered in Crete and it shows a runner completing his race before a man and a woman while symbols hover in the air above. 
Note how the speed and athleticism of the runner is captured in his striding pose, his muscled body, and his ringlets flying out behind him as little dots. The next two images, both on ceilings, show two sequences from the bull sports set. In the first, the leaper is successful, turning his somersault high over the bull's back. In the second, he has misjudged his leap and now will die horribly on the bull's horns. War and the Hunt It used to be said that the war and hunt scenes belonged to the aggressive mainland Mycenaeans, not the peaceful Minoans. But this proposition can no longer be argued because the new palace ceilings from Crete have now provided so many examples of warriors and weapons. The two gold cushions show duels, the first between two great warriors and the second between a warrior and a menacing lion. Both are depicted at the climactic point of the action, the delivery of the fatal thrust. The last image comes from a massive gold amygdaloid seal and I'd look, like you to look at it very carefully because it's maybe hard to distinguish. It shows a great bull caught in a net but twisting his body round to trample and gore the fallen hunter beneath his feet, its feet. These images of the bull sports and the war and the hunt show you something unique in ancient art. The willingness for a people to show that their heroes are not always successful. A brutal death is often the fate of the bull leaper the warrior and the hunter. Iconography, images of the world of fantasy. The Minoan imagination created a whole menagerie of fantastic creatures, hybrid humans. The human form is joined to animal bodies to produce the bull man and the bird woman seen in the lintoids here. The bull man is an energetic fusion of the body of the somersaulting leaper and the four parts of a charging bull. The bird woman is about to take flight with her wings spread. The monkey and the genius. The monkey is not strictly a fantasy animal since it is a real creature and was known in the ancient world and was often illustrated in Egyptian art. However, for the Minoans, it was at least an exotic creature, and in Minoan art, it is often shown engaged in human activities, as here, when it joins a woman to stand in worship before a seated goddess. The genius is a Minoan adaptation of the Egyptian hippopotamus goddess Ta'ert. As with Ta'ert in Egyptian art, the genius stands upright and acts like a human. However, the ponderous hippopotamus shape has been slimmed down and cinched at the waist by the tight Minoan belt. The metamorphosis of Ta'ert into the Minoan genius can be documented in seal examples from the old palaces on, and it is one of the most fascinating links between Crete and Egypt. Fantastic creatures. The griffin can be, can be shown at rest in an animal study as with the imposing female griffin on the cushion seal. However, it can also be the violent predator in the animal attack as on this fragmentary ceiling where in full flying gallop it leaps towards its lion prey. The sphinx by contrast is always peaceful, usually adopting some heraldic pose as with the pair on the gold signet on the right. The antithetical design is ultimately derived from the animals at the Tree of Life in the Mesopotamian tradition. Sphinx and Griffin are of course widely known in the East, but again, as with the genius, they have become thoroughly Aegeanized. The Sphinx now wears the Aegean plumed hat, while the Griffin has become the great Minoan predator, avidly taken over by the Mycenaeans who made it a symbol of their own fierce aggression. speaking to us through their iconography. In the last three slides, the Minoans and Mycenaeans have been speaking to us of their daily life, of their hunting and warfare, of their love of animals and interest in the sea and their fantasy world. 
However, can we go deeper into their lives? Who are the people? What are their stories? Who are their rulers and their gods? These questions become all the more urgent when we look at the great gold signets of the late Bronze Age. Here are three from Crete. On the left, one from a tomb at Ahanes. In the centre, one from a recently discovered burial at Poros. And on the right, a very large signet called the Ring of Minos, once thought to be a forgery, but newly recovered and now known to be genuine. All carry very involved compositions which use every part of the seal face to impart meaning. Strange symbols hover above while women and men shake trees and kneel at boulders or pole a grand boat across a sea. Great ladies are seated on flying birds or ashlar shrines and a small female figure appears on high above. There is no doubt that here we have images that are working within the rules of a subtle and complex iconography. In the other artistic traditions of the Bronze Age, those of Egypt and Mesopotamia, we would know whether these human figures represent deities or mortals, and we would also even know their names and the stories associated with them. This is because both traditions placed inscriptions beside their artistic representations and we can translate the texts. The Aegean artists did not incorporate text to gloss the images they made. And of course, as we know, even if they did, we are not able to translate the texts which are contemporary with the creation of the seal designs. As your eye runs across these detailed images, you come to realise the enormity of the problem of trying to understand the full meaning of Aegean iconography. The time is long past. The texts do not help. We cannot fully understand. Aegean's jewels, function, art and iconography. So tonight you've made a very long journey. You travelled back to 2600 BCE and then forward again through some 14 centuries, seeing all the wonderful advances which resulted in the fine seals and signets of the Minoan palaces and their legacy to the Mycenaean world. Along the way, how did the seals speak to you? Was it their practicality of function in the safeguarding the produce hard won from the soil, the grain, the oil and the wine? Was it the art, so innovative on a world scale and so beautiful to see? Was it the iconography, the images of daily life and celebratory processions of war and the bull sports, of the animals and the sea world and the world of fantasy? Even though we cannot fully understand what the images are saying to us, they bring us close to the artists who made the seals with such skill and the owners who commissioned the gems and wore them with such pride. May I ask you at this point to look again at your hands. Take the red jasper lentoid with its image of two successful hunters tying up their lion catch and place it on your wrist. This is not your favourite? Try the green lapis lacedaemonius lentoid with the somersaulting bull man instead. Or you may prefer to slip the great gold signet on your finger so you can admire the lovely ladies in the flower field. Perhaps there was another seal or signet that you saw tonight which would be your choice if you were commissioning a seal to have as your insignia. Which jewel speaks to you? Which jewel would you choose? Thank you for your attention. <laughs>